Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glusick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of well over 600 videos on monster ecology, fantasy world history, character classes and magic items on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button down below or backing me on Patreon where you get access to all of these scripts I write for these vids. Members of either also become members of the Secretive Gluminati group on my Discord server and of course subscribing to me here is a good idea as I upload at least twice a week and have a live stream every weekend so click that bell icon. Glazia, princess of the nine hells, lord of Melbolg, the sixth layer of hell and daughter of Asmodeus, the overlord of the nine hells. Glazia, as with most of the archfiends, derives her name at least partially from a real world mythology. Although Glazia Labolus, the griffin winged dog, is very different in every other way. So Glazia shares only the name and the fact that she's a commander of sorts. In this case, she's been linked with the Arignes devils as a uh, leader. The fact that she is the overlord of Hell's Daughter is a completely original concept written by Gary Gygax himself. Glazia made her first appearance in Dragon number 75 in an article that served as a preview of the then upcoming first edition Monster Manual 2. Here we see the first part of her political history in the Nine Hells with her depiction as a consort of the Archdevil Mammon, at that time ruler of the third layer of Hell, the nightmare swamp called Minoros. She's described as a well-built and good-looking diabolic woman, save for her bat-like wings, forked tail, horns and copper-coloured skin. She could cause fear just by speaking to an individual as well as use a number of spell-like uh, powers including granting the wish of another creature or murdering them with a single point of the finger. She could also animate the dead and had a lot of illusionary style powers, minor regeneration and could summon, summon Malabranch devils to fight for her. But she, when she did engage in melee combat she used a poisonous short sword. Later we learn that she has the power to infect victims with a disease so potent that it causes the flesh to almost melt off the bones while they scream in agony the whole time, eventually rising at her call as skeletal undead. In Dungeon Magazine number 197 it said that Glazia loathed Mammon and viewed her time in the stinking swamps of Menorahs as a punishment. She conspired with Focalor, Mammon's seneschal and a duke of hell promising to help him destroy Mammon. Now, <laughs> I'm really going to go deep into the politics of the Nine Hells on this one. It's a lot of history in this video, so you may want to grab a beverage and settle back. We're about to get deeply nerdy. Go ahead, pause the video, go and get a drink, because this is we're really going to get into it. Also, I dare say that in this one, you might want to listen to uh, this stuff a few times. It's like hearing about all the crazy shit that happened at a party you were at, but you were too wasted to know what all the drama was about in the kitchen and why the garage burnt down and why Debbie is now going out with Kevin and Tanya hates them both. Part of the problem in documenting the lore of the Nine Hells is that certain events that have been twisted into two different versions, uh, well many of the lore sources neglect to mention which the true sequences of events was. But I put in a lot of research hours on this one and shout out to the Great Library of Greyhawk for the excellent wiki pages and the bibliographies in particular. Checking back to the actual books and magazines was a lot easier thanks to those notes. Okay, here goes. In the second edition of the game, Glazia appeared in the supplement Guide to Hell, written by Chris Pramus. In this source book, she is no longer the consort of Mammon, but the leader of the Arignes, which she seems to have maintained into the modern era of the game. There is a bit more to this lore though. It's revealed that she is the daughter of Asmodeus and Bensosia. As since Asmodeus is essentially a god at this point of the game's history, Glazia has some extraordinary powers and freedoms of her own. Like the Arignes, she is, well, she can travel freely to the Prime Material Plane whenever she wants to, and quite often does so to spy on the Arignes and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. While there, she often seduces some hapless mortal while she's polymorphed and delights in bringing them back to the Nine Hells, revealing her true form and watching the realization of their doom spread across their face before she starts her inevitable torture. According to the Dungeon Magazine issue 197, Glazia was reared on hatred and taught seduction and intrigue by her mother Pens uh, Bensosia, who hoped to turn her into a weapon against her father. Much later, after a fight with Asmodeus, Glazia came to St Stygia in a bid to become Levistus's consort. Instead, in one of the greatest scandals of the Nine Hells, she discovered her mother in Levistus's embrace instead, and in a fit of rage, she slit her mother's own throat 
with her wickedly toxic blade. Now I should mention, this is not common knowledge in the Nine Hells, thanks to Asmodeus's twisting of events, with the help of his trusty pit fiend constable named Martinet. The official story goes like this. Martinet served as the escort for Asmodeus's consort Pensosia as she was leading a routine inspection of the Nine Hells. While they were travelling across Sigia, Levistus ambushed them and proposed that the Queen of Hell become his consort if she help him depose Asmodeus. The staunch queen refused harshly and passed by. Infuriated, the spurned Lord of the Fifth killed Pensosia and, and her pit fiend bodyguards while Martinet conveniently managed to escape the only witness to this crime. In truth, Martinet discovered an entirely different gory scene of murder and framed Levistus for it instead. Asmodeus duly punished Levistus by eternally imprisoning him in ice, elevating Gerion to the status of the new lord of Stygia. Asmodeus then sent Glazia to Mammon's court to become one of his concubines as punishment for her matricide. Now, all of this went on in a period where Asmodeus was paying very careful attention to a power play that had divided the Nine Hells in two rival factions, who were seeking to attain enough strength to take on Asmodeus directly and depose him. The timeline is actually, this is all Glazia's doing, but we'll get to that. Asmos Asmodeus had disposed Beelzebub, who had disposed Satan originally. This all came to a head when Glazia was consort to Mammon. Mammon was allied to Gerion and Despata and they were plotting with Mephistopheles, who hoped to depose Asmodeus. Against them was former overlord of hell Beelzebub, who was now known as Balzebul, who was allied with Zariel, Belial, and Moloch. This is the event called the Reckoning, still a hot topic of discussion in the Nine Hells to this day, and it is a prime example of just how formidable the mind and will of Asmodeus truly is. In the time leading up to the Reckoning, Moloch had a lover named Malagard, the so-called Hag Countess, who was, well, it was she who encouraged him to join Balzabul's alliance, suggesting he could dethrone Balzabul after Mephistopheles and Asmodeus were removed from power, inching his way up the power chain. Unbeknownst to Moloch, the Hag Countess was in secret communion, uh, communication with Gerion. Uh, oh, Gerion, you were so loyal to Asmodeus, why? He was eventually completely consumed by Asmodeus, and now only exists as a vestige uh, that we can be summoned by Diabolus and Binders anyway. That's Gerion, and it, I'll talk about him in a later video, I'm sure. Malagard arranged for Mol Moloch's armies to betray him. After Moloch's defeat, she counseled him that Asmodeus would respect his strength if he remained defiant, and so while the other lords fled before Asmodeus, Moloch alone stood his ground like a complete idiot. For his, his impudence, Asmodeus banished him with the Hag Countess as ruler of Melbog. So basically, the Hag Countess banished Moloch and he disappeared, disappeared from the Hells, and she set up shop in Melbog. Glazia, at the time of the Hag's ascension, was still stuck in the wretched backwater layer of Menoros with Mammon. At the time, Mammon was a pit fiend, not in his uh, slug-like shape that he was transformed into later. This situation intensified Glazia's hatred for her father, originally planted by her mother, until the thought of subjugating Asmodeus sub-consumed her. Her position as consort to a lesser archdevil afforded her few opportunities to rise in station, so she started manipulating events to suit her purpose, replacing her father as Queen of the Nine Hells was her ultimate goal. Too many archdevils stood between her and her ultimate prize, though. Any of them would we welcome the opportunity to weaken or replace Asmodeus, but most were reluctant to upset the delicate balance of power in the Nine Hells and risk losing their positions in the hierarchy. They needed only look to Levistus's fate to see what would befall them if they tried. No single archdevil would move against Asmodeus, he was simply too powerful, but if she could convince several to join forces, they might succeed where individuals had failed. Focalor, Mammon's Seneschal, and the true power of Menoros proved a ready informant for Glazia. He resented the foolish and cowardly Mammon, who indulged his hedonistic impulses and tormented the lesser creatures populating his realm, leaving its security and administrative duties to fall heavily on the Seneschal's shoulders. Glazia appealed to Focalor's bitterness by promising to help him destroy destroy his master, and thereby won a powerful protector as well as a reliable source of information about the Dominion's political landscape. She already knew that Asmodeus favoured Balzabul, 
and could depend on him to be a powerful ally, while Mephistopheles and Beelzebul despised each other and had clashed several times in the past. Asmodeus had gifted Malbolg to Beelzebul long ago as a reward for some despicable service, and the Lord of Flies allowed the Archdevil Moloch to rule in his name. A tangled web of alliances held the Archdevils together, as always, and all Glazier had to do was tug on one strand here to upset the peace, and at her urging, Focalor convinced Mammon that Balzabul was secretly amassing an army to invade Cania, the seventh hell. The Lord of the Third wrestled with this revelation, but eventually came to the conclusion that he could inform Mephistopheles to his advantage. Meanwhile, Glazier travelled to Malbog and recruited Malagard, the powerful night hag and Moloch's uh, former lover to her cause. Through her, Glazier fed information to Moloch that Mephistopheles was preparing to invade Malbolg. Moloch reported the rumours to Belzebul, who started amassing armies in response. Mammon warned Mephistopheles of the impending invasion, and Belzebul's growing armies confirmed the reports. And this was all Glazier had hoped for. The Nine Hells broke into two factions cleanly, with Zariel, Belzebul, and Moloch and Belial on one side, and Mephistopheles, Mammon, and Despater on the other. Both sides raising armies, both sides arguing and posturing, but neither could make that first move. Glazier realised a greater push was needed to nudge them to war, and she knew just how to accomplish this. Naomi, Belial's consort, had spoken out against Glazier's plotting and warned Belial to avoid the building tension lest he anger the Prince of Evil. Belial was on the verge of trying to broker peace between the two factions and had convinced Asmodeus to resume the blood war with a new invasion in the Abyss since doing so would unite the marshaled forces against a common enemy. Before the armies could invade the abyss though, Glazier crept into Phlegagos and murdered Naomi. Enraged, Belial commanded Zariel to turn her armies against Despata and lay siege to Dis. Belial's forces joined those of Balzabul and Moloch to attack Stydia, hoping to crush Gerion and sweep into Cania before Mephistopheles could mount a successful counterattack. <laughs> it all kicked off. The war for the Nine Hells raged on for an eon. It was absolute bedlam. Belzebub's invasion seemed a resounding success at first, but Mephistopheles was cunning. He'd sacrificed a legion of devils to maneuver around the enemy forces and invade Melodomini, while Mephistopheles' armies spilled into his realm. Belzebul recalled his forces from Stygia, where they had suffered terrible casualties at the Ice Devil's hands. This retreat freed Mammon to help lift the siege at Dis by striking Zariel from behind. Zariel's forces broke and fled to Avernus. Despater and Mammon, now united, converged on Melodomini to destroy Belzebul once and for all, and then turned their attention to Nisus and the Prince of Lies himself. What none of the Archdevils realised was Asmodeus had been aware of the plot from the very beginning, after positioning Gerion in Cania to protect him. Uh, he joined Mephistopheles in the attack against Belzebul, and once all was in place, Gerion sounded his horn, signalling Asmodeus's other agents to spring the trap. The Dark Eight, Pitfiend generals who had led an Archdevil's armies, turned on their masters and brought the war to an abrupt close. Scholars have theorised that Glazia was also Asmodeus' agent in the Reckoning, and that her task was to expose the treachery of the Archdevils and to help consolidate Asmodeus's power. If, they t if that is true, it was truly masterful, and they have kept that very secret. If the plan worked admirably, of course, the eight generals were given command over all the legions of battle and assigned to the Dominion defences in Avernus. There they hunted down and imprisoned Zariel. Another pit fiend, Bell, was raised up as a puppet ruler over the realm. Mephistopheles and Despater, who had intended to take the war to Asmodeus' door, emerged from the reckoning shamed and weakened, but with all their holdings intact, strangely. Despater, though, has refused to emerge from his Iron Citadel since the faction's defeat. Mammon, who was first to flee the battlefield, only earned disgrace and distrust from all his peers, thus diminished he would never again raise arms against the Prince of Evil. Strangely, though, Asmodeus' allies suffered the worst. Belial stepped down as Archdevil to give the throne to Phlegig of Phlegigos to his daughter Fernia. Balzabul, who had once prided himself on his beauty, became a loathsome slug-like creature, cursed and doomed to suffer for eternity. For his duplicity, Gerion was cast out from the Nine Hells and replaced by Levistus, who now rules Stygia from his icy prison, which is absolutely insane, but this is the way that Asmodeus operates. Moloch, goaded by Malagard to remain defiant to the end, was also exiled. His former consort claimed his titles becoming the Hag Countess of Malbolg. 
Lazia did not escape the reckoning unscathed. Asmodeus named her Queen of the Rurinies, lumping her with unwanted responsibility, a title that suggests honour but actually made her subject to the Dark Eight, who were, would watch over her and report her intrigues to the Prince of Evil. In effect, Asmodeus neutralised her and put her in as far from him as he could, basically putting her in charge of the Arinyes operations in the Prime Material Plane under the watchful eye of the Dark Eight, the pit fiends who essentially run the armies of the Nine Hells. What Glazia did not realise was that her new position as Queen of the Arinyes protected her from the Archdevils who had, by then, learned of her hand in the events leading up to the Reckoning. Nearly all wanted a chance for revenge, but none dared move against her while she was in the Dark Eight's shadows. Their influence and reputation is inestimable. Furthermore, her position gave her the opportunity to put her diplomatic skills to good use, and she recruited a small army of devils to aid her that she should have a chance to expand her power. That chance was not long in coming. Malagard was not content with Moloch's leavings. She craved more and more power and influence in the Nine Hells until she became a troublesome presence to her rival archdevils. As a hag, not a devil herself, her power was always military, militant, um, her owed favours and things like that, and her soul trade. So she was always in a very untenable position. The Hag Countess spent the next part of several years amassing souls for a ritual to transform herself into a god. But something went very wrong. However, <laughs> perhaps due to Geryon's meddling, but it seems to me it was very likely to have been Glazia's doing. Malagard suddenly grew and swelled uncontrollably on this as the soul's power flooded into her becoming a bloated and ever-expanding horror until finally her body sundered and split open releasing a torrent of filth that washed across the entire realm this was glasnia's chance to move with the hag countess out of the way she and her forces swept into melbog unchallenged there she named herself lord of the sixth and cemented her authority with a display of torture on a scale that few had seen before Malagard was not dead at this point, and Glasnia set about arranging and mutating her colossal carcass into a new nightmare landscape, replacing the rocky slopes and copper-covered fortresses with a forest of hair, prisons made of greasy paws, hills of twitching skin, tunnel networks of loathsome intestines, and a massive citadel with extensive dungeons formed from Malagard's still aware and infinitely tormented skull with a massive procession of towering ribs leading up to the citadel's gruesome entrance. No other archdevil has dared to challenge Glazia after that, though their hatred for her remains. Asmodeus even gave his blessing by confirming her title. Some now believe Malagard was never intended to be anything more than a seat warmer, a figurehead to hold the realm until Glazia was ready to claim it. With the Dark Eight holding the leash to the vast majority of Hell's legions, the other Archdevils lacked the strength to mount an invasion, and none would risk another reckoning to take Melvold. Thus, Glazia claimed her birthright, and is poised to become one of the most powerful lords of the Nine Hells. With her scheming eyes fixed very firmly on the eventual ascension to the throne as the overlord of the Nine Hells, once she kills her father somehow, exactly as Asmodeus has trained her over these thousands of years. I feel a need to reveal the secret of the Dark Eight, <laughs> finally, so here goes. <clears throat> Hold on to your hats. The Dark Eight are very interesting, one of the mysteries of the Nine Hells and tied in closely enough with Glazia to warrant me talking about them. Those of you who have not seen the movie The Princess Bride, first of all, shame on you, go watch it. Those of you who have, imagine that there is not one Dread Pirate Roberts, but eight of them. Each is responsible for a different aspect of the command of the Devil's forces in the Eternal Blood War. If any one of them dies or is assassinated, another pit fiend is appointed and given their name and responsibilities. Any who know this has happened are quietly murdered and the illusion of an unbreakable, immortal command chain is maintained. This is the Dark Eight in a nutshell. The names and responsibilities are follows. Cantrum, the original leader and ninth member, was killed long ago and never replaced. Only Belzephon, who is responsible for supply, and Furcus, who is responsible for mortal relations, are still alive and the original last remaining members of the Dark Eight. Then there is Zapin, responsible for immortal relations, Zimimar, responsible for morale, Zabos, responsible for promotions and demotions, Corin, head of espionage, Dagos, head of strategy, and Perza, responsible for research and implementation. 
As far as any regular devil knows, the Dark Eight have run the war for thousands and thousands of years. This stability is highly valuable. It has a great deal of mystique to it and is preserved at all costs. Even if it often involves assassinating valuable assets to maintain the secret, Glazia undoubtedly knows the truth about this, but she has never, and will never, reveal it. Those closest to Glazia described her as being obsessed with Levistus. She swings from pining misery to blind hatred, moving from one extreme to the other with little warning. Glazia has made no secret of her intent to carve out Levistus's heart and devour it. The only reason she has yet to do this is because her father has forbidden it and made Levistus very hard to get to. Many consider her outspoken opposition to Levistus as nothing more than posturing. Asmodeus would block her effort, and the Lord of Stygia is not unprotected. Another development troubling the infernal aristocracy is Glazia's curious relationship with Fiona, the current Lord of Phlegistos. Most of the Archdevils suspect that Glasnia was responsible for Nomi's murder, and those rumours have surely reached Fiona's ears. If so, they must not bother her, since she and Glasnia have been close since Melbog changed hands. Somehow, Glasnia has driven a wedge between Fiona and her father, Belial, and the old Archdevil has lost much influence over his daughter. A somewhat a rebellious uh, streak here. It cannot be long before Fiona sends him away to join the rest of the fallen fiend lords haunting the ruins of Avernus. Unlike the other lords, Glazia is not overly interested in affairs beyond the Nine Hells, but keeps her focus on the Dominion's political developments. She continues to be one of the greatest schemers and manipulators of the Archdevils, even though Malbog is the smallest and least populated of the Hells. The other Archdevils loathe Glazia and blame her for their fall in the Reckoning. Balzabul holds her in special contempt and assassin devils infiltrating her realm more often than not belong to him. Mammon, her former lover, remains bitter at her manipulation and would gladly repay her for the damage done to his reputation and standing. But no Arch Archdevil aside from Fiona is friendly with her, yet none dares incur her father's wrath. Glazia spends much of her time roaming her gardens or reclining in the luxury of her scale palace, Osia. A grand structure, lavishly furnished with the finest treasures in the Nine Hells that there is to offer, and that is considerable. Here she addresses petitioners in her audience chamber, while brazen devils and malbranches stand watch to ensure their mistress's safety. Also in attendance are Erinyes from Glasnia's own command, as well as Succubi, mortal thralls, and the damned who have caught her eye. Barbed devils, bone devils, cambians, chained devils, and other fiends also roam the sixth hell. She has gardens of unearthly delights, populated with Succubi and other incredibly gorgeous devils. They pamper any who enter and are used by Glasnia on her prisoners. She sends them into the gardens and then drags them back to the torture chambers back again for a taste of the gardens and sizzling pleasure and then back again for horrible torment. It's a very effective way of shattering the hopes and dreams of any being in her clutches. The hag's body has mostly rotted away now from the horrible corruption that spread from its insides, poisoning the entire six layer for a time, and now Melbog has mostly returned to its former state with jagged slopes of shattered stone, a constant rain of rocks and scree pulverizing anything exposed to it with countless caves and crevices, hiding refugees, mutants, freaks, and ancient horrors even the Lords of Hell have forgotten about. With above it, rising great fonts of adamantine pillars, roofs made of thick copper plates dented from their constant slamming assault of rocks and boulders, great fortresses, thousands of chains hanging with suspended cages holding broken and bruised prisoners, most of them infernal, who frequently bashed by speeding rocks. It's not a nice place, but then, it never has been. Long ago, when Moloch ruled, Malbolg was a shifting landscape of broken black rock floating atop a fiery sea. Here and there rose great bronze citadels, where Moloch would keep his prisoners and indulge in every wicked vice. Travellers through this hell required climbing a steep, unstable surface, where any misstep could mean a tumble into a pit filled with razor-sharp obsidian shards. Bubbles in the lava released noxious gases, clouds of grey-green glass that killed anyone who breathed the vapours. Malagard changed Melbog somewhat. Although the rocks still tumbled and shook, the shards rose from below the surface, the lava gradually cooled, cracked, and eventually stilled. The noxious gases gathered overhead to form a leprous firmament that rained burning droplets across the blighted realm. Those who roamed the place would sometimes hear cries and laughter issuing from under the rocks, as if someone or something was trapped below. 
After the hag countess's foolish attempt to achieve godhood failed, her bloated, rotting corpse spread across the entire hell in what was almost an artistic vision of Glazier, but built on decay and horrific cruelty. The damned souls enslaved to her predecessor became subjects for her experiments. Some of them she made beautiful to look at, but with them forever in her thrall, others she reduced to hideous, twisted forms, mockeries of flesh trapped in eternal torment. Of the current state of the Lair of Balbog, there are still remnants of the hag's corpse landscape. A forest of hair, known as the Forest of Sighs, is greatly reduced and home to giant hell lice. The trees of hair, well, each is a black twisted spiny thing oozing filth from the fissures in its trunk. Here is where many of Glazier's victims end up wandering through this little forest, with archdevil tires of her playthings, her servants whisk them away and pale them on the tree's branches. Even death dares not walk beneath the cruel boughs, and the victims might linger for decades before they rot away in torment. The trees are believed to feed on their souls, spreading tiny roots through each victim's body and pumping it full of nutrients to keep it alive until the soul is thoroughly consumed. So, just, just awful. As Malagard's skin and flesh rotted away from the surface and lakes and rivers of filth, the remnants of the true surface of Malbog were revealed. Twisting tunnels made from the guts of the giant hag still remain. Malagard's rotting bulk dripped into the subterranean realm, gathering in fetid, foul-smelling pools that spawned horrors beyond description. Devils, both those loyal to Glazia and others, wandered these halls, hunting the da damned and each other for sport. Every now and then, the rotting tunnels split open and released torrents of pus and goo into deep chasms that lead to older and fouler secrets. Mortal souls consigned to the Nine Hells face unspeakable tor torments, of course. Their existence is an unending ho horror, a march of pain and suffering. Each archdevil claims the souls of the recently dead, who bargained with those fiends or were stolen from the Shadowfell by night hags and sold to the devils in the soul trade. In Malbog, these damned find all manner of dreadful ends. Some dangle in the Forest of Sire become or well, uh, become playthings for Glacier, but most are marched to the birthing pits. Here, pain devils push them into fetid pools filled with wriggling larvae that chew and tear at screaming victims until they devour every last scrap of soul substance. Within hours of receiving a soul, a pool expels a shuffling mass of soggy flesh called a lemure. After this minor devil's form stabilizes it, it eventually grows into one of the larger and more dangerous fiends populating the Nine Hells. Malbog holds several birthing pits, but Glazia hates the sight and annoying cries of the wretched mewling lemures, so she stays away from them by preference. In Moloch's day, Malbog boasted 13 bronze fortresses, each one set aside for a different cruelty. The War of the Nine Hells saw many of them sacked and ruined, and the Hag Countess allowed the remaining strongholds to fall and dis disappear, so only one citadel remains of that original group, a great half-melted structure known as Slag. Glazia has not only tolerated Slag's presence, but encourages her servants to keep it standing, a, re a reminder of what was once here and what she had to overcome and what is now hers. Moloch used the citadel to dip his victims in molten gold, and after drawing their screaming bodies from the vats, he set them into niches where he could look upon their mumbling, muffled pain trapped in this precious metal. Evidence of his pleasure remains. Walking through the fortress's gallery reveals several hundred creatures whose final agonizing moments have been preserved in gold forever. Now, 5th edition has moved the focus away from the hanging prison fortress of the Chain Devils and instead turned Malbolg into the prison of the Nine Hells, reserved for the punishments doled out to devils that stray from their assigned tasks. I'm okay with this. These lawbreakers are put on trial in Phlegagethos, and if they are found guilty, which they usually are, they are dispatched to Malbolg to endure years of torment. I'm not sure why they refer to Glazier as being a criminal and all that guff. She may be rebellious and do things her own way, but that is exactly how Asmodeus wants her to be. Morton Canaan's Tome of Foes has this to say about Glazier. Of the Lords of the Nine, Glazier is the most unpredictable. She flaunts the rules of tradition and bends the law without actually breaking it. She delights in shocking others by springing gambits that catch them unaware. Mortals who go up against overwhelming odds with an audacious plan attract her attention and could win her respect and patronage. The reason behind Glazia's rise to lordship is the subject of much whispered debate in the Nine Hells. 
It's generally known that Asmodeus presented Glazier to the Lords of the Nine as his daughter, and she toured the Nine Hells on his behalf. While doing so, she put her own plans into motion, much to the surprise of the other archdevils, even before Glazier assumed the rulership of Melbold. She established the Hell's first organised crime syndicate, using her followers to purchase souls on her behalf while paying for them with what amounted to worthless coins. Was it Asmodeus' intent all along that Glazier would strike out on her own, or was it Glazier rebellious and clever enough to successfully defy her father? Was Glazier's rise to power an unforeseen benefit of her machinations, or is it a great embarrassment to Asmodeus? Likely only the two of them know the truth. I personally think that As Asmodeus has planned this all along, and the crime syndicate is just another means he has to discover secrets, operate freely, and gather information. There is a passage about devils and gender, which is interesting and certainly applies to the pit fiends and other devils, but it fails to convey that the lords, the dukes, and the high-ranking nobility of the Nine Hells are unique. So yes, they often do have a gender identity. Even if they reproduce in a totally different way, the fact remains that Glazier has always identified as female. Asmodeus is her father, and Benzosia was her mother. It is what it is. In the printed law, anyway. What you personally wish to do at your own gaming table as is and has always been entirely up to you. I just relay what has been written. The living game is your domain. Much more interesting, though, is the coin legions, an invention of Glazier that is quite brilliant. Taking a cue from the sword, shield, and dreg legions into which the devil's armies are grouped, Glazier established a new category of legion to realize her plans for profit and power, the coin legions. The members of Glazier's coin legions operate in a manner of thieves' guilds on the material plane. They have one critical advantage compared to their mortal contemporaries, Gla Glazier's knowledge of the law. She knew that in many cases procedures that devils observed and obeyed as laws were merely traditions, written in and seeming like law but actually not, and failing to observe a tradition carries no penalty according to the law of the hells. Glazier's scheme involved using counterfeit currency to buy souls in Minoros, then selling them soon after to turn an incredible profit. When the truth of her dealings became apparent, she defended her actions based on the legal definition of the coin as minted in Minoros. According to the law, the gold composition of the coin was strictly defined at the time of the coin's creation, but no law governed a coin state after it left the mint. As long as it was made in the mint, it was legal currency. Glazier got around the law by transmuting lead to gold, then having coins minted from the substance, after which she claimed her currency and her coins legion spent it on her purchases. The magic expired and the gold became lead once more. <laughs> Asmodeus, although he didn't punish Glazier for breaking the law, decided to discipline her by doing something only he could do, making her an arch devil. He reasoned that, now that she was effectively tied to a single layer of the hells and saddled with responsibilities in her capacity as prison guardian, her ambitions should be kept in check somewhat. To make Glazier's workload even more onerous, and to serve as an ironic form of punishment, Asmodeus decreed that Glazier would entice souls into nine hells only through delving into matters of contracts, bargains, and legalities. She and her agents offer mortal petitioners advice on how to manipulate or circumvent the law, or to identify escape clauses all to ensure that whatever they desire can be attained without violating a legal precedent. In a way, this is more of Asmodeus' training of Glazier, as you can see. Her petitioners want power, money, and love, but they want to come by it within the bounds of the law. Her, an ambitious prince who is entitled by law to inherit his parents' wealth, but doesn't want to murder them, might ask for help, and Glazier's agent provide it by arranging for them to die in an accident. A notable portion of Glazier's petitioners are souls who have pledged themselves to another Lord of the Nine and want out of the bargain. Her minions scour every contract and struck with another devil and approaching these mortals whose contracts contain loopholes. So another reason why she's absolutely hated by the Lords of the Nine Hells. In return for giving their souls to her instead, such individuals learn how to break the contract and negate whatever price the contract says they had to pay. And that brings us up to date with Glazier. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any devil lords you would like to hear about more, let me know in the comments section down below. If you like the lore in these videos, don't forget to check out videos by fellow Forgotten Realms lore masters. Check out my channels tab where you can uh, find a list of them there for you to explore. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise. Wear your geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. 